Okay, hello everyone. My name is Matthew Solomon. I'm the Director of Marketing at WPS. I wanna first off start out by saying thank you so much for attending our webinar. And I hope that you are all doing as well as you can at home. Um, without further ado, I'd like to just jump right into it and introduce Sam Goldstein. Sam most recently authored an assessment for us called The Rise. It's the Risk Inventory and Strength Evaluation. In addition, he's worked on a number of other assessments and projects. Um, he's a, 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 a friend of WPS, and we're so happy to have him here today. Sam, thank you so much, and I'll let you go ahead and begin. Thanks, Matt. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm coming to you from uh, my clinic office, where we see about four or 500 children and a few hundred adults every year with neurological problems, brain injuries, genetic disorders, other kinds of adversities that impact how their brain works and how they live their lives. And we're just a few blocks from the university campus, uh, close to downtown Salt Lake City, where it's uh, a beautiful spring uh, day. Hopefully the weather is nice where, you, where each of you are and you can get out and get some air and uh, think about uh, uh, better times ahead for us. Um, I appreciate the opportunity of talking you, to you today. Uh, and I'll tell you that just to give you a brief uh, overview, uh, this is a three-part talk. Uh, the second part in a number of weeks will focus uh, almost exclusively on resilience. Is it uh, a scientific concept? Is it something we should uh, talk about and care about? Uh, and uh, the third part uh, will introduce some new uh, concepts and ideas that I've been working on with my colleague, Robert Brooks. Uh, we're finishing up a new book uh, titled Tenacity, uh, The Seven Instincts That Make Us Human. And the third part of this presentation, uh, we'll discuss these instincts and, and how uh, they influence child development and how we can uh, shape and reinforce their expression. Uh, in today's talk, I'll start with a brief uh, uh, overview, as it were, and, and some foundation to set the tone of where we are. And I want to talk to you about what I've dubbed COVIS, Coronavirus Stress Syndrome, and why I think uh, we should think about it this way, uh, and, and how today's uh, children are coping with stress in ways that are very similar uh, to uh, the post 9-11 experiences that many of our uh, children now, uh, young adults, have experienced. And then we'll talk about five strategies uh, that I think are critical uh, in shaping children's stress hardiness uh, and their coping uh, and uh, resilience. If you wanted to gain uh, a look into the future. If you wanted to see the future, you could have your palm red. You could uh, uh, go out and have a, your tea leaves red. You could have someone look into a crystal ball. But if you really want to see the future, there it is. If you gaze into the eyes of children, they are the future. And, and absent uh, children, we have really no future. And our genes really don't care for happy, sad, uh, if we're having a good time or not such a good time, our genes want to move from a younger body to a younger body, uh, from an older body. And, and we're preparing children for a future that we can uh, barely imagine, uh, both technologically and, and both in terms of, of stress and demands on their lives. And so uh, I think it's worthwhile asking the question, uh, how do we go about preparing them for this future? And are we raising children in ways that are very similar to what we did years ago or educating them in ways that are very similar? And are those ways of, of parenting, are those ways of educating uh, consistent with what the future needs of our children will be? Or are they, in fact, uh, uh, something uh, that um, uh, uh, will uh, perhaps ill prepare them for that future? Um, I know I'm sharing my screen. I don't have my a mail turned off. And so you may see uh, some mail messages uh, come across my screen, but I'm not going to stop and go back and, and close that. Actually, I can. I'm just going to close my mail out so you don't get to see what mail I'm getting. Uh, and let me come back to the screen here. Okay, so children are the future. I want to start with a parable. There's a, a, a picture of an indigenous man uh, out fishing. And um, he's... Uh, uh, he, it's a beautiful day, and he's gone out fishing, and he's going to float down the river. He throws his line in the water, and he looks up, 
and he sees a child floating down the river struggling. So he pulls in his line and he paddles over to this child and picks the child up, puts him in the boat and begins to paddle to shore. And he looks upstream and he sees another child also uh, coming down the, the, the river uh, drowning. So he paddles over and he picks up that child. Now he's got two wet children in the boat. He's wondering what Huckleberry Finn uh, activity these children were engaged in. Uh, and as he paddles to shore, he looks up river and there are thousands and thousands of children floating down the river, each one drowning. He has more room in the boat, but he continues to paddle to shore. So one of the boys pulls on his shirt and asks, Mr. Can we pick up more children? We have more room in the boat, uh, to which he responds, uh, we don't have the time. Uh, I need to go up river and find out who's throwing children in the water and make them stop. Um, James Comer told me this parable. He's a wonderful pediatrician and director of the a child uh, school and child development program at Yale. And the river are the adversities that face our children. Uh, and you and I are those who are uh, charged with uh, pulling them out of the river when they struggle. And pulling them out of the river when they're struggling is a tertiary intervention. Uh, it's not primary. We're not preparing them <coughs> for risk. It's not secondary. We're not identifying those at risk and insulating them or stress inoculating them. It is tertiary care. And we have more uh, treatments. Uh, we have more medicines. It's not uncommon for children with mental health problems today to be taking multiple psychiatric medicines, something that was unheard of uh, 20 years ago. And I don't know if it's the advancement of good science uh, or if it's a response to uh, the desperation of increasing children uh, with increasing problems. Uh, I do know, for example, with depression, that the last six or so generations of children, of teens for that matter, have had an increasing uh, prevalence uh, and incidence of depression. Uh, and they are perhaps like lemmings at the edge of the cliff. As stress from life pushes, uh, they fall over. I do know that resting cortisol for ourselves and our children, an indication of, of our stress load, uh, is higher uh, than ever before. Uh, and what I'm going to advocate for is that we begin thinking about a different way of preparing children uh, to cope with the stresses and the challenges in their lives, a different way, <coughs> excuse me, a different way of thinking about educating them, a different way about thinking uh, about how they learn to socialize and interact uh, and relate uh, to others. Because uh, the tertiary care model, which has worked up to this point, I think in the future, will continue to fall further and further behind. And you're well aware of the, the statistics from NIMH uh, that the majority, if not a near majority of children with mental health challenges uh, are not only not identified, but not receiving any treatment. Um, the basic purpose of life is to prepare the next generation uh, for the future. As I commented, our genes uh, just want to get from an older body <clears throat> to a younger body. But we uh, are not salmon. Uh, we are not uh, snakes. Uh, we are not uh, orangutans. Um, our children require uh, 30 years till they're ready to grow up nowadays. Uh, maybe it's, it's not quite uh, that many years, but certainly our children are not born uh, with instinct to survive. They require more than a year of parenting, more than two or three years of parenting. Uh, and at the very least, it's 10. On the streets worldwide today, there are millions of children over the age of 10 who managed to survive. But development for our species is a long process. Our children are born with the genetic uh, uh, possibilities of acquiring all kinds of knowledge. But the experiences that are required uh, to acquire that knowledge is fairly extensive. And it takes a long time. And we're not in the matrix. We can't simply plug children in uh, and program them. So it's a long period before our children are ready to venture out into the world on their own. Uh, it's a world that has become uh, more technologically uh, complex. As Dickens wrote, it's the best of times, but maybe also it's the worst of times for children. When we look at the incidence of uh, children's uh, mental health challenges, the incidence of children's health challenges like uh, diabetes, for example, um, all of these phenomena suggest that it's increasingly difficult uh, to negotiate uh, childhood. Uh, but I am, for all my concerns, ever optimistic. 
I, I don't know that I was necessarily uh, the biggest fan of former President Reagan, but I like some of the things he said. And this is one of his quotes uh, uh, that I'm uh, uh, particularly attached to, uh, that, that when we make up our minds of what we want to do and how we want to do it, and we find a way to persist, there really are no barriers uh, to our ability uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, the phenomena that I'm uh, laying a foundation for for this discussion uh, is resilience. Uh, and <clears throat> about uh, 30 years ago or so, um, closer to 25 years ago, um, the then president uh, Bush the Younger uh, used the word resilience as he talked about uh, our recovery and our coping with the adversities we were facing at the time. Uh, and it became a very popular term. There's even a makeup uh, called resilience. And in, in the second part of this uh, series, I'm going to spend more time focusing on the history of this uh, and how it developed over time. But I can tell you that uh, 45 years ago when I started my practice, I was very well trained in finding out what was wrong with people. I was very good at <coughs> finding uh, challenges because the way we were trained was to find out what's wrong uh, and to fix it. And we assumed that by fixing what was wrong, we were evening the playing field for children who experienced uh, adversity. Uh, and I came to realize after about 15 years of doing what I do in this clinic, seeing children with complicated and complex problems, I realized that what's wrong with you tells me where you are, but what's right with you gives me a much better appreciation of where you might go and what you might do uh, in your life. After about 15 years in this clinic, I began seeing the children of my first clients or patients. So these were children I worked with during their childhood and adolescent years who grew up, had children of their own, their children had problems, they fondly remembered me, uh, and brought their children to see me, which uh, humbled me that they still had such positive memories of me. But I learned something interesting in visiting with these families, that some of the children I worked with who were doing well had lots of supports uh, as adults today were struggling. And some of those children whom I thought, despite all of our efforts, were going to experience a lifetime of challenges uh, were in fact uh, uh, doing uh, uh, poorly. So there was this reverse experience, meaning some of the children who were doing well uh, as adults were doing poorly, and some of the children who had done poorly as kids were doing well as adults. And it, it really shifted my focus away from what's wrong uh, uh, to what's right. It's not that I, I don't want to understand the challenges children face in their abilities or their knowledge or their experiences or their emotional regulation or their socialization. It's just that when you transition into adult life, no one asks you what you can't do. People want to know uh, what you can, you know, what you're capable of doing. So resilience is a process. It's not an outcome. <laughs> People seem to misunderstand that. Uh, it is not something that happens at the end. That's recovery. It's a process that leads to good outcome despite high risk. It's the ability to keep functioning under or in a stressful situation. And then yes, over time, it's the ability to keep moving on uh, and, and recovery may be part of it, but recovery isn't what defines it. It is this process. Uh, and the, 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 the uh, history of it is quite uh, interesting. Um, when you look at it as a fairly recent phenomena, uh, the research on resilience was uh, started not long after World War II let me just jump ahead to this slide. Uh, and I just wanna see if I've got, hold on, okay. Cause I can't see my slides that are coming up. And although I know what this slide deck says, I sometimes forget. Um, uh, after World War II, an exceptional woman named Emmy Werner began studying children who recovered from the war. Emmy has since passed away, I believe. Uh, Emmy wrote a number of books about her life uh, studies. And Emmy identified 400 children born into poverty on the island of Kauai. And she studied those children <clears throat> for 50 years. And she demonstrated that over time, assets trump liabilities for all but the most extreme 
conditions. And she really has been the major influence in our shift to a positive psychology. And sure, you, you will uh, recognize a number of names in the field of positive psychology and flow, but it truly started <clears throat> with Emmy Werner. And, and she began studying these children and in a way she was looking at single variables. Uh, what single variables predicted better outcome? For example, <clears throat> is it better to have one parent or two? And then over time, the research shifted and the second wave, and I credit Ann Maston with defining these four waves of research. In the second wave, we began studying, or she and others began studying how variables interact. Is it better to have uh, two parents who scream and yell or one parent who speaks calmly? That was the second wave of research, beginning to look at the interaction of variables. The third wave of research that perhaps started in the 90s and continued into the early part of this century, focused on trying to manualize these findings. Is it possible to create a program or a set of guidelines that you can uh, provide to children at risk such that they're more likely to be resilient or likely to cope with adversity over time? It's been an interesting line of research. Uh, it's been a line of research in which I think the claims have sometimes outpaced uh, the scientific proof. Uh, it's a line of research that feels good. It's good to know how to problem solve, to have empathy, uh, to relate to others. Uh, it's uh, a good to believe that these things make a positive difference in our lives. It's much harder to demonstrate that over time. And retrospective studies just don't work as well. Uh, Cross-sectional studies just don't work as well as longitudinal studies where you follow groups of children at risk provided with different opportunities to better understand and see what happens to them <clears throat> over time. And the current wave of research has moved into systems intervention. And the questions we're asking is, can we create environments, school settings, communities, uh, family programs that insulate and protect and develop a resilient mindset, not just in children at risk, but in all children? That in today's world, we can't build walls high enough or lock strong enough uh, to keep the world away from our children. And in today's uh, technology, uh, the world is at our fingertips and we know what's happening halfway around the world almost instantaneously as it happens. And when you look to see what kinds of things come across our personal devices, I would argue that more often than not, they're negative uh, and stress inducing uh, uh, rather than positive. Anne Frank in her diary before Emmy Werner began her studies wrote that she wasn't af afraid for her girlfriends or herself. Um, she was talking about squeezing through school, but she wasn't so certain about squeezing through math. She wrote this a couple of years later after being in hiding uh, that she had this courage. And, and her original writing uh, provides that analogy of the uh, small tree uh, bending in the wind, uh, but not uh, breaking, not bowing down before the blows that inevitably come to everyone. And, and Anne's strength, there isn't a single formula for resilience. Uh, it's idiosyncratic. What, what is important for one person may not be as important for the next person, but it is a finite set of variables that most of you uh, are, in fact, familiar with. Uh, but Anne's particular strength was she helped others. That was her great calling. And eventually, uh, when her sibling passed away in the camps, uh, she passed away. And a few uh, weeks later, the camp was liberated. But what an interesting woman who seemed to have this intuitive, perhaps instinctual uh, knowledge. And, and, and just as we talk about this idea of nature versus uh, nurture and biology uh, versus experience, um, <clears throat> I'm not a biological determinist, but I do think that the research has very well demonstrated uh, that a significant percentage, maybe 90% of who we are, is in our genes. The identical twin studies of twins who years ago were adopted apart and brought together by the University of Minnesota's project um, demonstrated how similar they were in so many walks of life. But if I could control 1% of the stock market, uh, I'd be the richest man in the world. And, and we as caregivers, we as uh, this generation of adults preparing children, if we can influence 10% of how those genes express themselves, 
we can influence 100% of the course of their lives and perhaps the course of our very uh, society. You know, if we can make that kind of a difference, consider uh, a child with learning disability in a, in a family that takes the time to understand and support the child uh, versus a family that <clears throat> doesn't have any interest and doesn't do anything to help. And we're well aware of the idea of multifinality in genetics. One can have genes uh, and the genes may determine uh, the boundaries of our lives, but our experience determines where our lives go and how those genes express themselves. So similar genes can lead to different uh, outcomes. Uh, uh, the athlete Tiger Woods, I suspect had he not had uh, a family motivated and interested in golf, uh, may have been an athletic person, but may uh, never have achieved <clears throat> what he has uh, in, in golf. So I do think that, that we uh, as caregivers, uh, it isn't that children are tabla rasas or blank slates that we write upon, uh, but rather it's an interaction. They're also not little homunculi like a rose that unfolds and no matter what happens, it unfolds the same way. There is a give and take and the give in the end, as Emmy Werner has pointed out, the nurture part of it trumps the nature in all but extreme circumstances. If we look at just some common predictors of resilience, and I don't wanna spend a host of time on these, um, but you can see uh, easy temperament, for example, I was sitting in a pub in London and a, a couple came in with a baby for lunch and the baby was probably 18 months old and within a few minutes, everybody loved this baby. People were patting him on the head and he was making eye contact and this couple told me that parenting was so easy, they were gonna have five children. And about the same time, a couple came in with a baby that I assume uh, they loved <coughs> just as much uh, but this baby was having a bad day, maybe uh, more than a single bad day. Clearly, the child was having a, a challenging temperament that day. And as dad moved the high chair, mom's uh, diaper bag slipped off her arm. She was holding the baby. She spun to catch the bag. The baby's foot reached out and knocked over a large pitcher of beer uh, into a person's lap. And they might be a one-child uh, family. These are variables that clearly make a difference. It's easy to feel like a good parent when your child seems to announce to the world, look what a great parent I have, look what a great kid I am. It's a lot harder when kids struggle. So when we look at longitudinal studies of outcome over time, these are some of the factors that contribute uh, to better or <clears throat> less uh, uh, functional outcome. Clearly children with easy temperament negotiate the adversities of everyday life much easier. Their daily experiences are more positive. And children with restless, impulsive, uh, or uh, easily angered or anxious uh, qualities of temperament struggle. And what they learn about themselves in the world is uh, very different. And ultimately that mindset, the ideas children form about themselves, for me are very powerful contributors. If you look at a few more of these, uh, the intelli intelligence one is interesting. <coughs> Uh, and we do find that people who are better at problem solving and reasoning. So I'm not talking about intellect as in having a high vocabulary. Uh, people that learn to problem solve. You remember uh, the work of, by Nowicki of locus of control, uh, taking responsibility for yourself and a sense of humor. When we laugh, uh, I think laughter on an evolutionary basis uh, increases our chances of survival. And so we are, uh, we are destined to laugh as a means of relieving stress and feeling comfortable and connecting to others. And when I meet a family and I take a history, because the best way for me to understand a child would be to follow them around for a week. But when I meet and take a history, I listen for those qualities because they will work with me. Easy temperament, consistent family relationships, uh, competent caregivers, and, and you know, competence is something we can negotiate or discuss, but a parent who has some idea and some plan for what they're doing, uh, a, a child capable of developing some sense of who they are and a sense of emotional security, I find are the most powerful. So in my history, I'm always asking about those variables as a framework to understand uh, the foundation and the life uh, the child lives. Uh, let me switch gears. And again, in the second talk, in a few weeks, I'll talk more about resilience, but let me tell you about Andy. And that's not Andy there, that's a picture that I <clears throat> borrowed from uh, one of the web sources. Andy's uh, 14, uh, a bright boy with social learning problems. 
I like to stay away from diagnostic labels. So he's a bright boy with social learning problems and I've been working with him. And he came in to see me a few weeks ago, <coughs> right as the, the pandemic began. Uh, and I asked him uh, how he was doing and he, and he told me he was stressed. His mother had previously emailed me because I asked parents to communicate before my visits with kids that he'd been very irritable at home and had some emotional outbursts. And, and she told me why she thought it was happening. But I asked him and he told me he wasn't worried about getting sick. He was worried about his dad because his dad, a small business owner, had closed his business uh, because of the pandemic, uh, was sitting home uh, watching television and not watching reruns of, of uh, Happy Days, but rather watching the news, shifting from one channel to another uh, and becoming increasingly more morose and obsessed and angry and fearful and talking to the family about maybe this was the end of days. And he was worried about his father's welfare, uh, which is interesting. And, and over the next two years, it will be interesting for us to look at the, the outcome of our actions. And, and I'm not for or against, I'm not advocating for or against, I'm just pointing out that there are long standing downstream consequences in mental health, in physical health, in economic health, in family functioning. It will be interesting to look at statistics of alcohol related deaths, of uh, family violence, of uh, suicide attempts or suicide successes um, downstream. Uh, not to create a, 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 co a comparison of how many die from one thing or another and what kind of a Sophie's Choice should we make, because it always is, if you remember the movie, it's always a Sophie's Choice. No matter what you choose, there is a downside to your choice uh, and there is an upside to the opposite choice that you don't get to experience. Um, I began asking some of the other children I was seeing in counseling. And again, the kids I see have complex problems. This is a clinic that we, we sometimes talk about as being the stop of last resort. The kids that come into our clinic have complicated problems uh, of an acute nature, meaning a brain injury, or complicated problems of a chronic nature and have seen lots of other professionals uh, with <clears throat> more than uh, a variable success, sometimes good, sometimes not good. But I've heard the same story uh, from other children. They're not worried about their health. Some are. But most are worried about what will happen to their family. And most are worried about uh, the safety and security of their parents. And so I began <clears throat> looking back at the post 9-11 literature uh, after the unfortunate uh, <coughs> attack on the World Trade Center. And, and uh, at the time, uh, there was talk of creating a diagnosis as if we needed more diagnoses, but you know, uh, post a World Trade Center uh, obsession uh, or depression, because people afterwards sat on their couches to the point of ignoring their hygiene and ignoring their families, and watching the news and wondering when an airplane might fly into their home or into their community. And I, and I noticed the similarities between the coronavirus and what was happening as a, a phenomena that stressed an entire community. Certainly 9-11 stressed our country more than others, um, but it's an unexpected event <coughs> that happened suddenly, 9-11. Uh, but here, the virus pandemic, while it seems sudden, was sort of creeping along. People were aware, scientists were aware of the potential risk until we reached critical thresholds and governments began to act. And even as their actions have rolled out over days and weeks, uh, even today, um, our decision-making processes, just as many parks are open in some states as just closed yesterday uh, in others. And, and sort of we become this speeding train, uh, trying to slow down uh, a phenomena that we uh, not only don't understand scientifically, uh, but psychologically is hard for us to grasp. Uh, and I think the rapid growth in technology in the last 20 years uh, has made it such that everyone has access to the web. Everyone has access to the news and to television instantly on <clears throat> their phones. And, and as soon as the pandemic began, uh, within a few days, there were specials on every channel. 
and people were watching. Uh, and as this teen's father, I think we're seeing some people uh, succumbing to these events. Uh, and here's how I define it. <coughs> you can think about it maybe in yourself <coughs> uh, or in your family members or in the, the people you work with, spending lots and lots of time watching news channels, spending hours posting and reposting events related to the pandemic. I have some friends on Facebook, the only thing they post is to repost news events, almost all of them adverse uh, uh, about the pandemic, <coughs> and not necessarily uh, to criticize uh, the current president, but to post uh, all of the various opinions and beliefs. Uh, and remember, a lot of what you hear is belief. Belief's a valuable asset in the absence of fact. But even when fact is put on the table, sometimes it's hard to find uh, belief. Uh, they buy household products that far exceed immediate need, sometimes because uh, we're scared into believing that this is going to happen next. Now, the next thing we're being told is that we're not going to be able to buy protein in the store um, because all of the <coughs> protein manufacturers <coughs> are going to close or not reopen. So now we can get toilet paper, but we can't get chicken. Um, setting alerts on the phone to get every news channel, texting friends and family and coworkers about related news events. Um, again, making the dire posts on social media, making the pandemic all you speak about with others, ignoring your daily uh, responsibilities uh, to the extent of ignoring your hygiene, uh, good rest and food. Um, clearly, uh, uh, this is a phenomena that any stressful event that happens to any of us as a family, as an individual, as a community, uh, leads to this kind of a risk. But here it's, it's a much greater risk, I think, because it's everyone. And not just in the US, it's everyone uh, around the world. And, and if you understand the, the relationship between stress and illness, you, you well recognize uh, that stress uh, leads to a cascade of biochemical changes in our bodies that have a significantly adverse effect on our health and on our mental health. This the stress illness link um, is not just a theory. Um, it starts as a theory, but there's plenty of data to show um, uh, that uh, uh, all kinds of illnesses, uh, from things like cancer to heart disease uh, to uh, diabetes, uh, certainly to mental health, um, are prone to be exacerbated by stress. I don't think it's just the emotional experience of stress. I think it's the biological uh, and physiological experience of stress. And, and I do think uh, then individual person characteristics, your age, uh, your mindset, your history. Um, I, I well recognize the seriousness of the, of the pandemic, uh, but I'm an optimist uh, in many ways. So I look to see what kinds of things are happening in a positive way. Um, I have friends who are just the opposite, uh, feel that whatever is happening is, is positive is clearly overshadowed and outweighed by anything that's negative. Um, and I do think personality and genetics and childhood experiences and other stressors um, really predispose us in, in terms of how we respond. Um, I think we don't know enough about who's really uh, at risk. I do think that people who are already struggling with mental health challenges have greater risk. I do think that people who are struggling with substance abuse or substance use have greater risk. Um, I think that people who are already experiencing economic hardship uh, have greater risk. And, and then you have to ask about uh, the potential downside of the intervention. We flatten the curve. And the primary goal of that, from my perspective, wasn't so that people wouldn't get sick as much as we wouldn't overload our hospitals with illnesses that could be treated, but because of the number of patients coming into the hospital uh, cannot be treated or are not uh, able uh, to avail themselves of uh, treatment. And I think that we've done a very good job on. I, I appreciate for those of you that are listening in, in New York, um, it's been a terrible thing. Uh, and But fortunately, in the rest of the country, for whatever reasons, 
our efforts at, uh, at staying apart and staying away um, have met with uh, reasonably good success. Yes, 50,000 people have died, but, and, and, and I, I feel for that. Uh, and I'm sure most of you understand the statistics of how many people die every year uh, from all kinds of things. Uh, but I do believe it's far less uh, than might have uh, passed away had we not taken some action. Um, so what happens to quarantine? People are socially isolated. What do we know in the research of social isolation? It, it causes increased health problems, increased mental health problems, increased problems if you're a child with schoolwork. You know, what's going on now is not homeschooling, it's schooling at home. And it's a terribly failed experience. Not just the children I work with who are clearly overwhelmed uh, to, to self-educate at home, but their siblings who, who don't have a history of uh, academic or related school challenge or challenges, or the friends of family members who also don't have a, a history of school problems. I think what we've demonstrated here uh, given the number of children who now at home are struggling, uh, they're unmotivated, not interested in working. Uh, sure, there are kids who do it, but it's a significant percentage. I don't know what percentage it is. We'll have to collect some data somehow and see. But <coughs> from my view, it's the majority of children with learning disabilities. It's the majority of children in special education programs, particularly younger children who are struggling. And I'll bet it's a third, if not more, of a normal students who now uh, are self-educating at home in a system in which some actually have Zoom meetings, some are teaching themselves, some look at videos. There's no consensus, there's no control group, uh, there's no, even within particular school districts in Utah, there's no clear uh, framework or agenda for how to, uh, for how to go about doing this. And, and I think that what we're seeing is that the structure of school uh, has adversely impacted the development of one of the seven instincts Bob and I have been researching and studying, and, and that is uh, intrinsic motivation. You know, young children are motivated to do things without getting paid, without any secondary reinforcers. They enjoy the experience of doing and helping. And, and in some ways, the school system we've created, I'm not suggesting that it, the school system is bad, uh, but it's clearly uh, behind the times. The school system we've created is such that many children have lost the intrinsic motivation uh, to learn and, and complete schoolwork, not so much to learn, but to earn a good grade. And, and when the structure of the schoolwork is absent, the structure that gets them there and keeps them working is gone, you can see the number of children, uh, at least in my experience, I'm curious to know what your experiences are, um, and we, perhaps we should do on the No School Psychologist site, perhaps we should start a survey and see what all our experiences uh, have been. Uh, but I do think uh, kids are struggling. And, and Bob and I are just working on uh, the chapter about uh, motivation and the risks of positive reinforcement. I'm not uh, Alfie Cohn, who's arguing that children are punished by reward, but we have to accept that when you create extrinsic consequences, there is a significant risk of intrinsic motivation uh, failing to develop. Um, and so quarantine leads to greater mental health, greater concerns about uh, health, uh, uh, frustration, and boredom. Um, if these symptoms fit you or a family member, I don't think you should despair. Uh, the lesson we learned from 9-11 is that most people over time uh, draw strength or gather strength from family and friends and eventually return uh, to more normal behavior. But it doesn't hurt to bring your concerns, if it's you, to a mental health professional, or to speak to a friend or family member in whom you recognize uh, these signs. And here's what I suggest. Don't watch more than a half hour of day per news. I remember growing up around the dinner table with my, I was an only child, my mom and dad. When dinner was done, uh, the news went on. I think it was Walter Cronkite. And there was a half hour of news, and that was the news of the day. And now we inundate ourselves with news. So I suggest you limit news. I suggest you turn off alerts from news channels on your device. I suggest you get aerobic exercise or obtain aerobic exercise, if not daily, then three times per week, for at least 20 minutes to a half hour. 
uh, my uh, dear friend John Rady, uh, in his uh, book Spark, uh, summarized the research on the role exercise plays in, in creating a cascade of hormones that uh, positively influence us. You know, the human brain uh, requires more neurons firing to sit still uh, than to move. We are a species that is programmed <clears throat> to keep moving uh, because thousands of years ago and for hundreds of thousands of years before that, if you stopped moving, uh, some big animal would catch up with you. You wouldn't find food, you wouldn't find water, you wouldn't find shelter. And so our bodies need that kind of movement and that kind of aerobic activity. I think you have to attend to your daily responsibilities. And if you don't have enough, find some. Write a book, start a blog, uh, <clears throat> do research. Research a topic you're interested in learning more about. If you can, uh, work. Uh, and if you don't have work, volunteer your time. There are plenty of, uh, of mental health uh, websites. There are plenty of uh, call-in mental health helplines that are desperately in need of people uh, from home to help out. Uh, I suggest you keep busy with family activities. I think uh, you should resist posting or texting bad news. Again, I'm not suggesting uh, that ignorance is bliss. I'm just suggesting that we not inundate ourselves with bad news. I think we have to reassure our children that the world isn't ending. Now look, if you think the world is ending, <clears throat> then you have a problem. Uh, the world is not ending. Uh, and in particular, human beings are uh, reasonably resilient. And in the United States, when you look at <clears throat> you know, who chose to get in boats and emigrate here, <clears throat> we have uh, a gene pool of people who are particularly uh, resilient. Sure, there may be adversities that go with the willingness to get in a rickety boat and not know where you are going to find something better. But I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. I, I suggest you consider a budget if you're worried about money and reassure yourself about how you'll survive if in fact uh, there's limited income or resources. Um, I suggest uh, that uh, if you're in a position to counsel others, uh, that you make sure you're providing people with accurate information, <clears throat> that you're available to answer the questions uh, uh, of your family, uh, of your clients, and of your students. Um, you know, that uh, whatever is needed is available. And if a neighbor is such that uh, <clears throat> they, they can't get for themselves, uh, that you help them. Uh, and again, the limited research on quarantine, if you're looking for something to research, pull up the research literature, <coughs> which I did, because I'm not an expert on quarantine, um, and, and take a look at the literature. And very clearly what comes through is that the shorter the duration, uh, the better, and that the duration should always have an end point. And so while some have criticized uh, uh, governors and the administration uh, of our country for picking end point dates, in fact, it is what the research and literature uh, suggest. Um, and again, uh, voluntary quarantine is associated far less distress and fewer long-term complications than restriction of liberty. Uh, and there really are some concerns about the extent to which um, uh, we can be forced uh, to, to stop doing or to stay inside. I think we should do it voluntarily, uh, but when people are told to do it, uh, some people uh, resist. Uh, and I think it's an altruistic choice. Uh, the goal shouldn't be uh, uh, self-quarantine uh, 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 because you have to, but because it's good for all of us, not for some of us. For the kids with, which you work, with whom you work, I, I suggest you communicate the facts as is age appropriate. I suggest you have parents make time uh, to talk uh, and answer kids' questions. I'm suggesting that families I work with <coughs> have a question and answer time. Uh, every couple of days, uh, what do you want to know? And let me see what I can tell you. I think you reframe the current stress. And as my dear friend Bob Brooks points out, help children take a helicopter view. And by helicopter view, I don't mean you hover over them, but you rise up and realize we have a long road uh, ahead of this and, and that the current stress uh, is a time-limited phenomenon. And, and I, I do think that those 
uh, even who believe that uh, into the new year of 21, um, we're still going to be dealing with this. I, I don't have a problem with that, but I do think uh, that the future is many, many years, not a single year. Uh, and so I think we need to look into the future and reassure our children uh, that their future, uh, this is not their future, and that wearing masks uh, uh, is not what they're going to do for the rest of their lives necessarily, but certainly the lessons we learn about how to avoid uh, uh, transmitting easily communicable diseases uh, is a good lesson. So there is something positive that comes from this. I think we help our children think logically. I think we listen for catastrophic thinking, the all or nothing thinking that some people do and try to challenge that. I think we offer empathy. I think we model problem solving. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute uh, the model of problem solving I've, I've started to use in case you want to use it. And I think we ought to have a time of the day where everybody relaxes. Uh, one child I see came in and was upset because his mother is forcing everyone to take a nap. And we had a discussion of uh, alternative ways of relaxing in the afternoon uh, because this boy didn't feel uh, uh, or didn't believe he was a baby any longer and was, was resisting the idea of uh, napping. Uh, the late singer-songwriter Tom Petty, who was a favorite of mine, wrote in his classic song, Crawling Back to You, most things I worry about never happen anyway. So worry is a survival strategy. When we worry about things, it alerts us that we need to think about it and we need to perhaps take action. But a lot of the things we worry about, as Petty has said, never happen. Uh, and when you're facing a worldwide pandemic like this, uh, everyone's uh, worry genes kick in. Uh, everyone uh, worries, and it's important to have a realistic view. Uh, worry is in our genes. It keeps us alert and aware of danger, but it can also consume us if we're not vigilant, if we're not uh, proactive. But I'll tell you, as, as, uh, as Matt Ridley uh, wrote in one of his uh, books, Ridley's a Darwinist, that while our genes have programmed us to worry or to be selfish or sometimes to be aggressive, they've also programmed us uh, to be optimistic, to be motivated, uh, to possess empathy, uh, to relate uh, and care about uh, others. Um, you know, I think... Uh, our capacity uh, to cope um, is about functioning uh, well over challenging times. It is a resource that we all possess and we have to harness in difficult times because our children, uh, while we want them to do what we say but not always do what we do, they're going to do what we uh, do. My axiom is that through intelligent and ethical educational and therapeutic practices, we can help kids develop self-esteem and mental health and resilience in ourselves and in our students without stealing away uh, their hope uh, and uh, their dignity. Now, I have a few minutes left and um, I'm gonna show you these five strategies, but, but in the time I have, uh, I'm, I'm not going to review each of them. I'm gonna leave that uh, for the next talk. It's hard to time. <coughs> Uh, these talks out. Um, but there are five strategies that Bob and I, for the last uh, 20 years, have really focused on uh, in an effort to uh, help develop a resilient mindset in ourselves uh, and in others. Um, uh, uh, it's empathy, uh, how we communicate with others and how we make an effort to understand them. It's teaching responsibility by encouraging contributions. It's teaching decision making and problem solving it's offering encouragement and positive feedback, and it's helping kids uh, deal with mistakes. And I'm going to jump ahead just to the problem solving uh, one. Um, and this is the, the model that I have tr traditionally used. Myrna Schur developed this, uh, Schur and Spivak, in their original problem solving uh, model, in their original problem solving uh, framework. And um, let me move this here. And uh, I've always used this, but I've been using a new one. And I don't have a slide, but I'd like to tell you about it. And I'll talk some more about it the next time. And my friend Alan Fine developed it. And it's called GROW, G-R-O-W. 
And, and uh, when kids face a problem, um, I like them to say, we need to grow. We need to grow about this. And G stands for goal. What are we trying to accomplish? R stands for reality. What's the reality of the circumstances? What obstacles <coughs> have prevented us uh, from accomplishing uh, this goal? And uh, what obstacles uh, might stand in our way as we move forward? So G is goal, R is reality. O is options. What options do we have? And I try and have kids pick two or three options uh, and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each. And W is way forward. G for goal, R for reality of the circumstances, O for options, W for way forward. And if it doesn't work, uh, then we go back and consider other options and consider whether there are other uh, obstacles uh, that are creating problems and uh, move forward uh, from there. Uh, I find that kids like that grow uh, analogy uh, much better um, than uh, just what's my problem. So what's the mindset of a resilient child? I think they feel optimistic and hopeful. They feel special and appreciated in the eyes of others. <laughs> they learn to set realistic goals and expectations. They view mistakes and obstacles as challenges to overcome rather than hardships to avoid. Uh, they, they are confident that they have a way and a means of solving problems, that there are adults in their lives to support them. They have an internal locus of control that helps them take responsibility for their behavior. <coughs> and they start out with the belief that in fact they can solve whatever challenges, whatever problems that come their way. They are, uh, as I've commented, uh, uh, intrinsically motivated and instinctually uh, or intuitively optimistic that they can succeed. Uh, this pandemic has created all kinds of challenges, but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to measure ourselves, to measure the stress hardiness we possess, to, to better understand our children, and to view this experience as an opportunity to teach and an opportunity to help our children prepare for the challenges they may face in life. And the last uh, comment there is on empathy. There are two ways to create a masterpiece. Uh, you can start uh, with a piece of marble and you chip and chip and chip at it. Uh, and if you make a mistake, uh, then you have a pile of rubble. It's a hard way uh, to uh, create uh, art. And it's an even more challenging way to raise a child. And some children see us as chipping away at them. And I've had children tell me that uh, it isn't that people are trying to help them, it's that people want to change them. They don't like who the child is, they don't accept uh, who the child is. Not necessarily what they do, but who they are as a person. Uh, the other way of creating a masterpiece, start with a lump of clay and spin it and turn it and move it. There's no waste. Uh, it's a flexible approach one that responds to the challenges of whatever adversity is in front of you. And I'll ask you in this time to consider, are you a chipper? Uh, do, do children see you in your role as parents or coaches or professionals as trying to fix them, as being dissatisfied with who they are? Or are you, and I'll uh, use the term for lack of a better description, are you a lumper? Uh, uh, do children see you as helping them be better? Uh, do children see you as truly caring about what they do uh, or who they are? Uh, Dan Brown, uh, you know, he wrote um, uh, a number of very popular uh, novels, uh, including The Da Vinci Code. He wrote in his recent book, uh, May Our Philosophies Keep Pace with Our Technologies, May Our Compassion Keep Pace with Our Powers, uh, and May Love and uh, Not Fear Be the Engine of Change. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful quote. Um, that, that really makes us think uh, about uh, have we taken the time uh, to keep pace as human beings in our philosophy, in our ways of parenting, in our ways of educating uh, with the technology uh, that has surrounded us. Um, one of my projects that I'm trying to get started on, I'm calling Inside Out Schools. And I'm asking the question and I want people to tell me, what will schools be like in 50 years? And I think we'll turn schools inside out. Will they be freestanding structures, 
How will children attend school? Uh, what will they do? Will teachers still be fonts of knowledge standing in front of the room? Or will teachers be uh, motivational guides or instructional coaches creating environments in which children motivate themselves? And sure, they may learn from the teachers, but they may equally learn on their own uh, or from uh, their classmates. I took this picture on the Miracle Mile in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And the first time I saw that sign, uh, I thought, oh my goodness, uh, uh, children have now uh, become uh, antiquated. Uh, they are a vestige of our past. We've put childhood in a museum. Interestingly, it was a toy museum of all places. But Neil Postman wrote in his book, The Disappearance of Childhood, as I commented at the beginning of this talk, that children are living messages we send to a time and a place we will never see. And the world is changing so quickly that the future we create for our children, most of us can't imagine. Today as adults, we live lives that as children 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, we could never have imagined or predicted. Sure, we would go to the World's Fair and they would tell us <clears throat> what our future lives would be like, and most of the time they weren't right. Uh, but sometimes they were. You know, how do we prepare children? And I'm going to argue that we prepare them uh, by uh, helping them to develop a resilient mindset, by attending to these qualities of instincts that for tens of thousands of years uh, were the basis upon which uh, children learned and grew and transition, transitioned successfully into adult uh, life. Um, I'm happy to entertain some questions if Matt wants to ask them. Um, there's my website. If you visit my website, um, I'll, I'll put this slide deck up on my website uh, if you want to download it. Uh, if you visit my website, there's all kinds of articles. You can subscribe to get an article, not every month, uh, but probably once every four to six weeks or so. I won't sell your name to anyone. Uh, you won't get any solicitations from me for books or, or programs. There's my email. And I answer all my email. There's my uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook and my YouTube talk called The Power of Resilience, which I was uh, fortunate to do in 2013 about uh, this clinic here uh, and what we do with this clinic. Uh, and that's still up on YouTube. I'm happy to say people are uh, still watching it. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you all today for listening. I know we don't have a date for the second uh, meeting. Uh, hopefully, it'll be sometime in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and again, as I indicated in the second uh, webinar, I want to focus on is resilience an evidence-based concept? What do we know about it? How does it interact with a mental health? Spend a little bit more time uh, talking about strategies that can be incorporated, whether you're a behaviorist or a cognitive therapist or Rogerian. Uh, these kinds of strategies can be incorporated in whatever kind of uh, counseling or therapeutic work you do. And then in the third seminar, uh, I'm hoping uh, to address uh, tenacity and the seven instincts uh, that make us human. Uh, so Matt, I'll uh, turn it back to you. Uh, thank you all for listening today. I hope uh, uh, some of the time uh, spent today uh, was valuable uh, and helpful for you. I know that when I go to a meeting, if I take away two or three ideas that I can use immediately, uh, then I feel like my time has been well spent. Uh, thanks again. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, and to all the participants, we really appreciate you. Um, we'll be sending out an email that will include the PowerPoint. Um, in addition, we're going to answer all of the questions that you've put into the Q&A um, in a document that Sam will get to look through uh, via email as well. In addition, we'll provide you with links to all the things that Sam mentioned. Um, you'll have a plethora of resources to look through after this call, and we intend on sending that out at some point between next week and between tomorrow and Monday. So you'll get all this information. Again, we just wanna really tell you how much we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for attending and look forward to the next session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.